Yes. Um, so we're talking about functions and we're talking today about representing functions. which is a sprawling and kind of chaotic topic because functions are so important. Many people over the years have had their own opinions about how best to represent and present them. Um, so I'll talk about ways of representing functions and sort of what they're used for. Um, so we'll start with a very classic, but also very classroom way of representing functions. So this is not something you use in most real world contexts, but it's a very classic way of presenting this material to children and newcomers. And it's to think of a function just as a machine that you feed an input to and it does something. and then shoots out an output. So maybe it takes the, the machine takes the input and squares the input, then adds five. So if the input is two, we take the input, we square it, we get four, we add five, we get nine, and nine is our output. And I mean, the advantage of this as a learning tool is that it doesn't require any kind of special notation. I mean, we're explicitly writing out, here's what this machine is, here's what it's doing, it's very, I won't say self-explanatory, but it's something you can show to children and sort of hope that they understand it. I mean, maybe for the very little kids, you would not want to start with squaring the inputs, but you can get the general idea across. Um, so I guess if I were making a pros and cons list, easy to understand and present to children. And I mean, I'm talking about teaching this to children because this is math for elementary, but I mean, also for inexperienced adults. I mean, in my college algebra classes and so on. And I mean, the cons probably pretty clear. This is very unwieldy. Um, it's taking up a lot of the whiteboard, and if the rule was take an input and square it, and then take the same input and cube it, and then add those things together, and then divide by the cubed root of the input, obviously writing that out in words is going to be kind of a hassle and kind of hard to understand. I mean, that was... Um, as a historical note, if you, and I don't know why you would, but um, if you ever tried to read Greek mathematics, you know, in translation, I mean, ancient Greek mathematics, um, 
They did not have any like addition signs or form to the stuff. They just wrote out everything they were doing, and it is not easy to parse. Um, there was there was a time probably going back to the 1950s when, when people would buy a copy of Euclid's Elements in Translation to put on their shelf and show how sophisticated they are. One suspects that, that very few of those copies actually got read. So, the next sort of three ways that the book offers of presenting um, functions, I'm going to sort of group together because they're very similar in the spirit. And both of these ways basically come down to listing inputs. and outputs. So the textbook separates these into tables, ordered pairs, and arrow diagrams. And we'll go not in the order that I have these written. Um because I've already look um I've already sort of used arrow diagram. So let's start with that. Arrow diagrams look like this. You write inputs and then you write arrows and the arrows go to outputs. So arrow diagrams mostly get used again in kind of a mathematical Medical setting, but but you also see them sometimes in like flow charts, for example. And you know the pros of arrow diagrams are, I think, very similar to the pros over here. The idea that you've got an arrow pointing from the input to the output is relatively easy to understand. I mean, if you see four going to nine, you can say, oh, when your input's four, your output's nine. It's pretty straightforward. Another pro, and this is going to be a pro for all of these things, is that to create an arrow diagram, we don't necessarily need a mass rule. By which I mean a lot of functions sort of in the real world are not, have nothing to do with the equations that we're used to looking at in algebra classes. I mean, a very sort of everyday function would be a price function, a menu at a restaurant that takes the order as its input and gives you the price of the order as the output. 
And this is not a formula. You can't, you know, take the square root of the pasta to get your price. And, you know, a lot of the sort of very standard ways of representing functions only work when your inputs are numbers and you have equations. In fact, maybe I should, instead of, well, I won't erase it, but in all three of these cases, one of the big pros is going to be what I just said, that we don't need a mathematical formula. So all of these work well when our inputs are not numbers. Um, and the cons of all of these are going to be basically the same. That if you're representing a function this way, you're basically just creating a list. And, you know, this works fine for our restaurant menu, where there's this finite list of orders you can make and this finite list of prices, but it works very badly for something like the square root, where there are an infinite number of inputs and an infinite number of outputs, and you can't actually write down a list of all of the inputs and the outputs. So for this to really work well, we need finite amounts of data, finite amounts of inputs, and finite amounts of outputs. Um, and now we'll look at ordered pairs and arrow diet, sorry, and tables. And these, again, there's a reason I'm clustering them together for an arrow diagram. You've got this list, input to output. If you erase that arrow, put a comma between them, and surround them in parentheses, you've now got an ordered pair. So the pros and the cons are basically the same, except that I'm going to add in a pro here. This is good for visualizing a function. because we can graph ordered pairs. And we'll talk about graphing later in class today, but Otherwise, it's sort of got the same pros and the same cons as um, an arrow diagram, because this basically is an arrow diagram. We just rewrote it very slightly. We replaced the arrow with a comma and shut parentheses around the whole thing. Finally, 
you have a table. And of course, this is probably the single most often used method in the real world. We see tables very frequently. So suppose you've got an arrow diagram. Um, and we've got a bunch of data listed like this. Well, to convert it into a table, we'll put a horizontal line, we'll create a cross piece like this, we'll probably label that we've got our input and our output, and there's a table. I mean, it's, um, again, it's, it's probably something you see very frequently. I mean, I keep talking about menus, the, the bean broker menu looks basically like this. You've got the drink, versus the price. So you can look at it and see that a coffee is whatever a coffee is, $2.17. And so these are ways of representing functions. Um, they don't necessarily require an equation. In fact, I'll go further. I've said that this is a probe. And I framed it as a probe because in most real world situations, you don't have equations, you know? But it's also a con. All of these work really badly when you have equations. Mm -hmm. And that con is directly related to this con. Usually if you have an equation, there are an infinite number of possible inputs. And you can't list them all on a table. You can't list them all as ordered pairs. You can't list them all as arrow diagrams. So the next way of representing a function is kind of the classical college algebra way. We can represent a function using an equation and function notation. So when I say an equation, I'm envisioning something like this. We're interested in the area of a circle. And we're going to create a function whose input is the radius and whose output is the area. So there's an equation relating the radius and the area. Does anybody know it off the top of their heads? Pi r squared. So, um, but 
for the, just a second not using R, if the output is the area, we can write the output in terms of the input. It's pi times the radius squared. And again, the input is the radius here. So long before most people ever see functions or function notations, I mean, in this very class, you see equations of true variables. So the idea that we can call the area A and the radius R and set up an equality between them, a equals pi r squared, is probably not foreign to us. I mean, it definitely isn't because we talked about it in this classroom. So function notation is just taking this equation, taking this equality, and very slightly rewriting it. We give our function a name, and we talked about this uh, Monday. The most common name is F. And instead of writing A equals pi r squared, we write F, the name of our function, <laughs> In the parentheses, we write the input, which is the radius, and then the right-hand side of the equality is unchanged. F of r equals pi r squared. So, The, the pro of this is that it's a very compact way of writing functions. I mean, compare and contrast square the radius, then multiply by pi. I mean, clearly, this notation is more compact, takes up less space, and is hopefully easier to understand than just writing the whole thing out. We talked about that a little earlier today. Um, the pro... So... How do I want to say this? Um, so this is a pro of using sort of equality signs and multiplication symbols and naming your variables. Um, what might not be immediately clear I and mean, we can write A equals pi r squared. And we can write F of r equals pi r squared. Um, these two things are basically the same. 
They're both telling you that to find the area, you square the radius and then multiply by pi. So the real question is thus, why do we use math symbols instead of writing everything down? The real question is, why do we use function notation instead of just writing down the qualities like you see on the right-hand side? And that's because things like this make it easier to comment on the output for complicated inputs. And that statement, as it stands, may not be totally clear, but we're going to talk about composition either today or after the test next week. And once we start working with functions, and in particular, once we start doing composition with them, we're going to see clear advantages that this notation has that this notation doesn't. So I guess for now, I'll put a pin in this discussion. And let's talk about graphs. And sort of again in the in the real world, as it were, I mean you're not going to open a newspaper and see a complicated form of those. The way that data is presented in the real world is usually going to be either where are we? way back, apparently. The way that data is presented in the real world is going to usually be done either by table or by graphs. And graphs are a way to visually represent a function. And the way that we create a graph, we create what is called the Cartesian plane. It's some, some mathematical concepts sort of seem so elementary that it's hard to believe that someone invented them at some point. But the Cartesian plane is named after its inventor, René Descartes. I probably mispronounced that, a French mathematician, very uh, significant. So, The Cartesian plane, I'm going to phrase this in terms of functions for the moment. The Cartesian plane is formed by putting two number lines at a 90 degree angle to each other. So this number line, which I've labeled input, Well, it's a number line. It can go in the positive direction. It can go in the negative direction and so on. And this number line, 
which shall be more. It's late in the day to be asking this question. I hope that the colors I use, I mean, I've been told the orange isn't good, but I hope that this is all, you know, easily visible from, okay. Um, so the output is also a number line. And of course, this only works if your input and your output are numbers. So the bean broker cannot use a number line or cannot use a graph to represent its price because the inputs are in numbers. And then if you have an input and an output, if you have an input of two and an output of four, you go to the input line and you find two, and you go to the output line and you find four. And you put a point there um, where those dotted lines intersect. And of course, the dotted lines are actually kind of distracting. So in the real world or in practice, you would do that mentally and not uh, mess up your paper with a lot of dotted lines. So that's the Cartesian plane. Um, the story, you never, you never know if these stories are true. The story is that Rene Descartes was sick in bed one day and he was watching a fly crawl around his ceiling and he asked himself as an exercise if I wanted to keep track of the fly's location, how could I do that? And that's the origin of all of this. So this is probably basically familiar to all of you. I mean, if not, it's perfectly fine. That's why we're teaching this class. Um, but it's probably more likely that when you see this material for the first time, you don't see those number lines labeled input and output. What's probably more likely is question is that you've seen it in terms of an x-axis and a y-axis. And this is where the idea of a graph ties back to the idea of representing functions using ordered pairs. Because traditionally, when you write down an order pair, the traditional thing to do is to call the first number in the order pair X and the second number in the order pair Y. So if you're calling your input X, and your output y, 
then the input axis turns into the x-axis. And the output axis turns into the y-axis. And in terms of notation, you should have at your fingertips. Probably we don't want to go too in depth here. But you should probably know that the point where the axes intersect is called the origin. So the origin represented as a point is what? I mean, what's its x at? What's its x coordinate? Zero. Y coordinate is also zero. So the origin is the point zero comma zero. And Graphing is really powerful. I mean, there's a reason that when you look at newspapers and stuff, you see data represented as graphs instead of just represented in raw tables. Because, I mean, if you have a visual picture, it's very easy to represent or to identify, I should say, trends in the data. I mean, I don't want to, to do anything in this class that's that's could be accused of being political, but I mean, when you see like people talk about global warming and they talk about how temperatures change over time. It's very easy to look at a graph. Time versus the maximum temperature and see, well, this does appear to be going up. I mean, maybe, maybe sort of more immediately relevant to us if we look at, you know, years and um, high school average math test scores. You know, if we see a picture that looks like this. I mean, there's some kind of random variations. And then maybe we see something like this. And you say, well, in this year, something happened that radically impacted test scores. You know, maybe this represents the start of the COVID epidemic when everyone suddenly had to go online and no one was quite sure how to teach or how to learn in that context. So graphs are very good for representing um, that, for seeing, I should say, that kind of trend in data. Um, graphs also let you represent infinite amounts of data in a compact and finite way. Yeah. Like, let's say we have a function and you know, f of x equals x squared. So here's a function that can have an, as its input any real number. So if you want to sort of represent this and you want to try to give somebody an understanding of what this function is doing, how can you do that? I mean, you certainly 
and create the table of every real number. And if you tried, I mean, if you created a table with a B of N entries, and then you shoved it into somebody's face and said, hey, you look at this table, what would they do with it? I mean, um, but if you're representing it visually, you can say, well, the graph of any re of x squared looks like this. And then you can write little arrows to indicate that it just keeps going up in both directions. And now people can look at this and instantly have a handle on what f of x equals x squared does. This is also good for when you have complicated equations. It's very hard for anyone, and I include me, doctor of math in this, it's very hard to just look at complicated equations and sort of grasp anything out of that. So, f of x equals 2x over 3x squared plus 1. Equations that look like this show up a lot in um, medical papers, in, in medical modeling papers, I should say, where people are trying to use math to study medicine. And if you're just looking at this equation, it's probably pretty inscrutable. Then when you look at a graph, it looks like that. Um, not quite like that because my I am not exactly desmos.com, but there we go. That looks a little better. And why does this show up in medical modeling? Well, now that we can see the graph, the answer makes a lot of sense. Functions that look like this to represent, are used to represent drug concentrations in a patient's blood stream. And if we didn't have the picture, if we just had this equation, I mean, I think your first question would be why? Now that we can see the picture, it makes sense. The drug is administered, the drug spreads through the body, it passes through the cell walls, the drug concentration is going up. Eventually, your body purges the drug, the drug concentration goes down. Makes perfect sense. And with the graph, we can see that it makes perfect sense. So, um, that leaves us with composition, which is not a four-minute topic, so we'll, um, we'll call this here. Test is Monday, um, and we'll pick this up on Wednesday. If anybody has any questions between now and the test, just shoot me an email, and I'll get back to you.